Welcome to Try Your Best, a refreshing and approachable podcast dedicated to the exciting realm of innovative technology. As a collective endeavor of the minds behind Ghost Creative, Precision Point, and the Code and Compassion newsletter, we aim to make technology not just accessible, but engaging for everyone. Hi. Hi. How are you? Impressed that you did that better than I did the first one. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know about that. Um... So this podcast's topic is foundations, <clears throat> and I would like to get your opinion on how you have seen technology become an integral part in our everyday lives and businesses. Mm. So, you know, we print these things out, and we have them prepared ahead of time, Um And this first question uh, I've really been thinking about, and this is what I landed on, to to convey how integral it is, when is the last time you spent three consecutive days with no internet and no screen in front of you? Oh, um... (laughs) Three days. Three days. This table is loud. Three. Um, gosh, I don't know. Maybe maybe when I was in the military, deployed yeah. somewhere. Which was how long ago? 2013, 2012, right. yeah. And, and I would imagine that answer is probably similar for a lot of people. Um, and the only time we do that, we do it deliberately. Like we have to work to yes. get away from the internet and from screens. We're going to go camping and we're purposely not going to take anything with us, right? Yes. That's how integral it's become is that we don't even think about it. We don't – it never even crosses our mind that I'm going to wake up in the morning and within 15 seconds of being awake, I'm going to touch a device with a screen and internet connection. Yes. And um, I really it, – it really makes me wonder – like, what would our life and business be like if we spent three days without a screen and internet connection? Mm-hmm. What would our brains do, mm-hmm. right? We are using this technology. It's an integral part of how we think. And we're using the technology. And with ChatGPT, it's getting, it's going to get more interesting. We're using it to replace creative thought, right? Mm-hmm. We're using it to replace communication, We've talked recently about handwritten letters and the value of handwritten letters, right? Yes. Um, we don't do that anymore because I can just text you or I can just right. call Nobody you. does. Yeah. Right. And so it's become so integral that it's transparent. I mean, but to be honest, I think our grandparents did us a disservice because they wrote everything in cursive. And honestly, by the time you're 60 and trying to write out something by hand, it, it doesn't look that good. <laughs> I remember getting... Uh, uh, a congratulatory card from my grandmother uh, mm-hmm. for graduating high school, and I couldn't read it. I had to take it to my mom, and she's like, "Well, I think it says," but the value was still there. I still cherished that card, even though I couldn't read the words that were on it. Right, and and it didn't. Um, I still have cards that people have written me. We have a little box in our closet where we have our keepsakes, and we have cards in there. I don't have a single text message in there. <laughs> No. Right? I don't have a single one. And that doesn't mean none of them meant anything, but like it's just different. It's right. different when somebody sits down, removes technology, and takes the time to deliberately write you a letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it to you. That's different. It just has a different feel about it right. than somebody typing out a text message to you. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, how have we seen it become an integral part? It's, it's what I said earlier, right? Like it's transparent. Once things become transparent, you don't even know you're doing them anymore. Right. They are integral. Yes. Because you only realize it when it's taken away. A few months ago, um, the Verizon service was down. <laughs> and there was like pure and utter panic yes. across every social media platform. Is your phone working? Is your phone working? It's like Verizon's down. Like, you know, I, I picture the scene from like Bruce Almighty, if you've ever seen that movie, when he gets like – fed up with everything and he's like yes to everything right and there's like complete and utter chaos because everybody hits the lottery and they won like three dollars right and that's what i picture happening when the cell phone towers go down just people running in random directions because we don't know what to do but our this integral piece of our lives is now missing right and we don't know how to handle it yep um 
so so you know I talked a little bit about this, but there's been a lot of technological revolution over the past hundred years, and specifically over the past couple decades, right? Um, how do you think? Give or give me some examples or how you're thinking about um, technology revolutionizing industry. Mm -hmm. I love to use GPS as a good example for this. Mm -hmm. So it started as a military platform and it's a, and it's, it, it's a reliable, unbeatable platform in, in my opinion. Um, but it allows for very precise maritime navigation. It allows for crazy things like cruise missiles to be able to land in like postage stamp size target boxes. Um, and so from a military perspective, it's a, it like, it's a great tool, but then as it became more democratized, we began to see things like, uh, Garmin GPS devices and, and Tom Toms. And depending on what region of the world you lived in, one was better than the other. We took a Garmin GPS when we were stationed overseas in Europe and it was horrible because their maps are all around us based objects. And so TomTom Tom, on the other hand was fantastic in the EU, but horrible in the United States. Now we see things like Waze, Apple maps, uh, Google maps, and they're all just as good as one another. You're just picking different feature sets. But the really amazing thing to start talking about is like construction layout. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm sure this is near and dear to Jonathan Marsh's heart, but like the total station, it's the weird box that you usually see on construction sites that's got uh, a thousand buttons on it. And uh, they're using it to lay out the foundation of those structures. And at first, the technology wasn't trusted. If you go and talk to the guys at Perry Construction here in town, when they were doing, I believe, the new Walmart out on Westridge Road, they had laid everything out, and one of their old foremen had driven by the job site, stopped, came back, wandered down onto the job site and found somebody and said, this doesn't look right. As I drove by and glanced over at it, passing at 45 miles an hour, something doesn't look right. So they went into the total station and found that it had some elevation settings or something, you know, some yeah. configuration was wrong. And they ended up saving millions of dollars in rework by fixing that problem. And so, but now if you go to one of those big construction firms and say, would you set up a building without a total station? They'd look at you like you were crazy because of the time and the effort that would go into doing that would be so labor intensive that it would probably cost them the project. So GPS is a, a great example, but it's like the core of so many different products like Waze and no, not Waze, Uber and Lyft. Like there are so many products that you don't even think about. Like when you go to order Chick-fil-A or uh, McDonald's, it wants to know your location. Well, why does that matter? So you can get your food from the closest restaurant to you. So it's just one of those amazing pieces of technology, like so many others that have made that piece of glass and, and plastic in your pocket. So vitally important. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how technology influences various aspects of our business or businesses in general when it comes to efficiency and productivity? Yeah. Um, that's something that we're we're passionate about, right? We've talked about it before, but like the the improving efficiency. And for us, I'm going to say this out loud probably multiple times over the course of these podcasts. Yes. Efficiency for us isn't just about making more money, right? It's right. about allowing people to get to work, do the work they need to do, and get home for their son's baseball game or their daughter's gymnastics tournament, right? Like it's it's about doing our jobs well so that we're not continuing to lead the world in um, lack of vacation days and long work hours. Right? Gary, Gary Vee has a great quote about this. He's like, if I have a guy that's a top performer and all he wants in life is $200,000 a year in salary, his health benefits, and to be able to attend every single one of his kids' baseball games, that's the guy I want on my team yeah. because he knows what his priorities are. Right. And so I think that's yeah. hugely accurate. Yep. Um, 
and we're still not doing it very well, right? We, <laughs> no. we, we had this, we had this, this software revolution, um, and a lot of different software packages got built and they're really, really good. And they're very, very siloed, right? Like it does one thing really well. And, um, we still have a lot of manual processes around getting data from one software system to another, yes. uh, one hardware system to another, right? And so there's a lot of opportunity there to go in and, and massively improve efficiency by removing manual repetitive work, right? Um, mm -hmm. Here's what I think the biggest struggle is. It's not a technology struggle. Technologically, it's not hard to do the majority of those things. Um, there's two primary problems in my opinion. One, some companies don't want to share their data because if they share it, it gives you the opportunity to leave the platform. And our argument is always the same, make a better product, right? <laughs> so if I make yes. a software product and you use it for five years and you don't have a way to get your data out of it, it's very hard for you to leave that platform. And a lot of companies are still using that model, right? Like we would rather hold your data captive and keep you a customer then make sure that you're happy and keep you a customer. That's that's one problem. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is businesses are too busy running good businesses to improve the efficiency, right? So like if my business is doing well and uh, I'm making money and I'm hiring people and things are going quote unquote well, why would I take the chance of breaking something by improving the efficiency, right? And that's how companies are thinking about it. But I think it's the wrong way to think about it, right? And and how many times in movies and TVs over over the last two decades have you heard, if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix, fix it. it? That's exactly right. And that's what people are going with. And I'm like, yeah, but <sighs> define broke, right? Cause, because <laughs> right. turning a profit and everybody working 16-hour days, I would argue that that's broke, Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still broken. It's just not broken in the way that you're defining broken. Right. And when we define broken, I'm like broken means is it running as efficiently as it could? If not, it's broken. Right. If my car should be getting 25 miles a gallon and it's getting four, is it broken? Yep, it's broken. But these businesses are using that mindset and saying, yeah, but it's still moving. Still yes. moving. We're still going yep. forward. When I put it in reverse, it goes backwards. When I put it in drive, it goes forward. Therefore, it works. I'm like, nope, it's broken. It's not sure. nearly as efficient as it should be. Um, you know, and there's so much we could talk about there, but it's it's really about that, right? Like, are you willing to take a hard look at your business and say, yeah, there's some opportunity for improvement here? Um, all right, let's uh, let's talk to uh, Nostradamus Tim for a second. Uh, Help me out, make some predictions about the potential impact of some of these ongoing technological advancements, right? There's a lot of them and they're happening daily now. What do you think this is going to look like? You know what my answer is. You always know what my answer is to this. It's as Apple in their Vision Pro uh, politely calls it machine learning. Meanwhile, the rest of the industry is talking about AI or large, large language models. And <clears throat> I love Apple's marketing because everyone is terrified of AI right now. With a like 40%, okay, I, I see where you're going with, yeah. right? But by using machine learning uh, marketing language, they're there's so much of Apple's product that has machine learning already baked into it. And we use them every single day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but so my answer to that question is chat, AI, chat GTP, machine learning, however you want to refer to it, is going to be the thing that enables us to spend humans to spend more time with other humans if we leverage it correctly. Um, Henry Ford said if he asked his customers what they wanted, they would have told him a faster horse. Uh, and he came to them and brought them the vehicle. And now it's a integral part of our life in North America. And if somebody were told that they had to give up their car to, 
you know, uh, they would lose their minds. <clears throat> and I think AI is the same kind of tool. It's going to dramatically change the landscape of business and ordinary life in ways that we can't comprehend yet. But at the same time, uh, if we do it right, it will allow us to have more time for enjoyment in addition to being able to do really valuable work. I think we've allowed tedium to become commonplace. And so that gives us the then the agency to be like, well, I have to I have to make 500 widgets today, so I'm going to make 600 so that I can spend more time with my kids on Friday. When in reality, if you could have a robot make the widgets and you could figure out how to make the widget better, but only work 20 hours a week doing it, then you get those 20 hours to go spend with your family. And that's really the important thing at the end of the day. Yeah. So I'm looking forward. I'm going to ask you to look. Uh, oh, no. That's my. You're supposed to ask me another question? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but let me add something to that. Um, you know, we've, I'm going to have to talk to chat about this script that it wrote because this is. Chaos. Slightly out of order. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing we hear about all the time with when it comes to tech revolutions is loss of jobs. Yeah. And, and that's a real thing. And, like, right now, like, I'm, I'm empathetic to this because there are massive amounts of layoffs mm -hmm. in the tech industry. Like, yes. massive amounts of layoffs. Mm, dozens of articles this week about Silicon Valley's collapse. Yes. Supposed collapse. It, it depends on who you ask. Some people are like, sure. oh, this is horrible. VCs are tearing their hair, hair out. And then I went back in and read a couple of comments on the article that was talking about that very thing. And there are VCs who are like, we still got money, bro. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this same thing happened in the Industrial Revolution, right? Like, mm -hmm. what did the guy that was selling, like, buggy whips like horse whips for buggies do right because <laughs> when the motor came out he's like man my business is hosed right yeah, i mean with the motor <laughs> it's it's always gonna happen you you saw you see and you see kind of like microcosms of this of like the the like grocery stores that have self-checkouts and there are people that are like i'm never using one of those that's a great example do you know that walmart actually is hiring more employees in stores that are fully self-checkout because <laughs> They're able, they're pushing so much, the, the volume of product they're pushing through their stores is so great that they need more people stocking shelves and taking orders out to people's cars and delivering them to people's homes that it's inefficient for them to be standing at a cash register for 10 yes. hours a day. And this is what inevitably happens, right? Like in the Industrial Revolution, if you go back and read, everybody was like, there's going to be 50% of people out of work. Nobody's going to have a job anymore. And you're seeing the same exact thing happen now. And maybe it's just because I'm a, I'm a forever optimist, but um, I, I think that we're just going to find other things that we can spend our time doing. You know, we, we had this, like, we don't have to have people push plows around fields anymore. And so those people are not just sitting in the field waiting for the day that they have to push a plow again. They went out and figured something else out, right? Uh, is look it painful? At, Absolutely. Yeah, but look at esports. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As as a as a kid sitting on the floor in front of my tube television in the 1980s playing Nintendo for the first time. Yeah. I imagined I couldn't possibly imagine that kids would get paid to play video games and win millions of dollars in competition every year. Like, it's outrageous, but they don't have to go work at McDonald's. They can stream on a platform like this. <laughs> right, right. And there's an entire industry built around that. Yes. So, yes, again, I'm not saying this with lack of empathy because people are going to lose their jobs, and that's very painful. And um, But I'm, I'm confident that new jobs will be created. Yeah. So tell me, Tim, what your vision or your, your viewpoint of – the history of leadership in the tech industry, right? We just talked about uh, a lot of layoffs and, you know, the, like massive amounts of layoffs. And um, some of that comes from leadership, some of it doesn't. But give me your take on leadership in the tech industry and kind of how it's evolved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go straight for the jugular with this one on, <laughs> uh, on my boy Steve Jobs. Um, 
to to effectively make Apple the product company that it is today, he had to make ruthless decisions, almost overtly aggressive decisions. Mm -hmm. And aren't there three biopics now on on Steve Jobs, or the only two? Anyway, he was so controversial in what he did running those businesses that he got fired from Apple and got hired back, probably to the chagrin of investors. But nobody could do what he did. And even now, I bet if you sit down and talk to Tim Cook, he'll say, I, like, we're just trying to improve on the end ideas that we have right now. But what's really interesting, especially with Vision Pro coming, <clears throat> is that he always said that that piece of glass and plastic and, and silicon is the worst part of this technology landscape because it is as slow as our as our haptic fingers can manipulate that device. And once we get to a place where we don't have to interface with it with our fingers, we can truly transform the way that humans work and compute and all that kind of stuff. So you have the core of technology's business growing through this ruthless, aggressive, abusive relationship that it has with its employees and its customers and all that kind of stuff. And now we're seeing this real, like the conversation we had a couple of minutes ago, this real pivot to people, people centric, um, life centric. Uh, we talk about work life balance, but it's really just managing your priorities effectively. Um, and, and giving employees the space to be themselves and contribute the best that they can to an organization, which increases their joy and then vis-a-vis -vis their productivity. And it was a lesson that I learned early on in my military career. If I take care of the sailors that are working for me, they will take care of me. They will make sure that we're meeting our objectives and we're doing the things we need to do with integrity. And, and so all my job was as a leader was to be the shield and umbrella to make sure that they weren't getting beat up too much by somebody who had unrealistic expectations. And so it's beautiful to see that pivot in the industry to where we're going from talking about profitability to talking about person, people and humanity and the products that are coming out of the market are groundbreaking. So I want to add one thing to that because I just had a I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, and I've you know ad admitted flaw in my leadership style is I'm probably too patient, and that might sound counterintuitive, but um, <laughs> I'm sometimes too patient. And Tim is laughing because he knows this, um, and I'm too impatient. So. <laughs> Somehow it balances. Yeah, and, and I talked to a to a gentleman yesterday, and he he talks to a lot of business leaders, and he said the number one thing that he hears ninety percent of the time when he asks them the question, "What's the worst decision that you made in the last year?" Ninety percent of the time, the leaders say, "I waited too long to fire somebody." Ooh, and that's so relatable too, right? So it's it's hard because we're trying to walk this. We're trying not to be Steve Jobs, right? You're trying not yes. to be Steve Jobs. But at the same time, you have to be um, – it's not ruthless. You have to be direct. It has to be candor and kindness, right, where there are times where yes. you just have to make hard decisions. And sometimes those hard decisions are getting rid of get, – getting somebody out of your company, right? Um, and so my fear in leadership, because I've seen myself make it, is when we're talking about this like – caring for people, that part of that is we let a company suffer because we actually made a bad hire. And that's how we view it, right? Like when we have to let somebody go, we look at it as we hired the wrong person. I feel horrible when we have to let somebody go because I know that means we messed up. We brought the wrong person on to begin with. But have you ever, and I've seen this a couple of times, have you ever been let go and also been relieved. 
Yes. I think the deeper conversation there is even the poor performers, when they're not doing well, know that they should be doing something else. Yeah. But they also have that love-hate relationship with getting paid. <laughs> yeah, well, Jack, Jack Welch, who ran GE for a while and, like, saw massive amounts of profit, right? He wrote a book called Winning. Um, and in there, he talked about how every year he promoted the top 10%, fired the bottom 10%, and his job as a leader was to get as many people from the 80% into the upper echelon and over the next year, right? Figure out who those top performers are and keep moving them up. And uh, it's like somebody asked him, like, the bottom 10%, like, that's a lot of people. That's hard. And he goes, I look at it like this. If you are performing in the bottom 10% of your company, you're in the wrong place. So Either in the wrong job or mm -hmm. doing in the wrong industry or right. maybe your heart's just not in it. And so he says, as hard as it sounds, and this is going to sound callous, but – I have to let them go so they can go find the thing that they're actually meant to do. Yes. Because this is not it. You wouldn't yes. be in the bottom 10% of performers if this was actually what you were supposed to be right. doing. Right. So. What value do you see in transformational leadership in tech, especially with inspiring and motivating folks, people? I hate this question. Okay, then we can skip. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to answer. I'm going to so, answer. So, <laughs> what what's your favorite pizza topic? <laughs> so, I don't really know. I hear a lot of this talk about like transformational leadership and these like uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too old, but um, I hear a lot of these words that I'm like I feel like nobody actually knows what it means, but we just keep saying it over and over again. And you know, then somebody writes a book about it, and we're like, oh yeah, that's what we're talking about all this time, right? The power of buzzwords. Yeah, exactly. Right. We have these buzzwords, but I mean, I think there is. I, I think it's really. I think the way you inspire and you motivate people is, one, you have a clear vision, right? Like I can't be inspired to go do a thing if I don't know what the thing is that we're working towards. Um, so I think a lot of it is you have to have a clear vision for where you're going to be able to inspire other people to follow you to go there. If you're, if I'm like, man, do you want to go with me? And you're like, where are we going? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you're not going to be like, yes, let's go, right? Um, and so it, it's really, it's really like, Let's make sure that we have a clear vision as a company that allows us the possibility of inspiring and motivating people to to go do that, um, to follow us in that in that dream. Um, the other thing is, I think a lot of motivation comes from caring for people, right? When when yes. I can actually like somebody knows that I care for them, and we have a clear vision, we can say like, all right. Let's get some roadblocks out of the way so that we can go attack this dream that we've decided together that we're going to go after. Um, and so to me, like a lot of these – there's books, like I said, written about this stuff and there's there's tons of podcasts and YouTube videos on it. And I'm like I think we're overcomplicating it, mm -hmm. right? We we care for people. We listen. We just talked to, to one of our guys today about like what's your love language? Right? Like that's a conversation we should be having in a business environment, right? Because yes. it's like, listen, if if um, if words of affirmation are not your thing, I don't have to tell you every day how good you're doing. I still can. But when I say that, I have to know that that's not actually filling you up, right? right? And so, I, you know, I just think that we lost a lot of humanity. And I don't know when it happened, but we lost a lot of this humanity of like we can have conversations in a business environment that don't in that don't revolve around profit margins. Uh, yeah, I think we lost our humanity when we started pursuing pursuit, pursuing the bottom line is the most important thing. Right. <clears throat> and I'm like, I, I jokingly say to my dad on a regular basis, your generation totally screwed up what we were doing <laughs> with business. And he looks at me and he's like, yeah, but we made money doing it. <laughs> he's not wrong. <laughs> he's not wrong. But there's room for both, right? right. And I think that's what we're talking about. Yes. It's like, there's room for both. For sure. Yep. Um, all right. Situational leadership. What does that mean and how do you <laughs> view that as, as valuable in the tech industry? This was the question that I mulled over the most. <clears throat> and the first word that I wrote down here is awareness. And um, I'm going to go back to chat as, an, as a good 
al- allegory. No, that's not the right word. Uh, Let's just go with it. Let's just call it allegory. Let's it's go. not an allegory. <laughs> mom, don't be upset. Um, <laughs> my mom's an English teacher for context. <laughs> Speaking of context, so uh, situational leadership is all about context. And if your business philosophy as a leader is to make sure that you're profitable or that you're hitting your wickets or whatever the whatever the thing is, yep. um, and you don't have the context of what's going on inside your organization, if your top performer comes in week after week and is crushing it and then suddenly is doing something other than crushing it and you go and beat on him, he may have had a loss in his life. He may be going through marital problems. He might be struggling with an illness. There's a thousand different things that if you're disconnected from your people, what are you getting? Profit. Well, you can only buy so many Bugattis before it gets obnoxious and pointless. And if the thing for that guy is going to his son's baseball game or a woman going to her daughter's dance recitals or, or vice versa, whatever the, whatever the thing is for those people, the, the lost context is what crushes businesses. And there are, a dozen stories running through my head of people that were working for me that the leadership didn't care about people's personal problems and they're like, just fix it. And so I have to go back and be like, look, I know you're probably going to get a divorce in the next month, Mm -hmm. but I still need you to do your job. That's not okay. So I, I think the, the context that we get, the awareness that we get by knowing our people and talking to them about people stuff and not profit stuff is going to dramatically change the way that the tech industry works. And I think that there are developers in Silicon Valley and executives in Silicon Valley who are trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. And if they start embracing this kind of mentality whatever they end up doing is going to be fantastic because they're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. What are your thoughts? <laughs> Here's a good one. <laughs> what are your thoughts on servant leadership in tech and how does it contribute to a supportive and collaborative environment? Yeah, I, I think it goes, I mean, it comes right off the heels of what you said, right? Servant leadership is caring for people. What does it mean to be a servant? Right, like you're you're serving the other the somebody. You're serving somebody, right? Um, When we hear the word servant, or when I hear the word servant, I think of somebody that's like forced to do that. Yes. Right. And you know, I'm not I'm not ashamed to say that like when when I read the Bible, Jesus was the best servant leader ever. He didn't have to serve anybody, and like that as an example of like somebody that doesn't have to serve other people but chooses to serve other people. It's the epitome of what Jordan Peterson talks about a lot in that being a monster and knowing how to control it. Yes. You've got Jesus who is the Lord and ruler of the entire universe. And here he is washing people's feet or fill in the blank. And imagine, imagine how that makes the person being served feel. Right. That to me is the the missing piece of this is like you're not serving so that they can do their job better. You're serving so that they're fully committed because they know you are right. If I'm serving my people well, I can't imagine sitting there with somebody that I feel like I don't have anything for them. Right. I, I got not. There's no way I can help you. And this person's like, no, no, you can let me serve you. Right. Let me serve you and then I'll help you figure out how you can help the rest of the people on the team. Right. Um, now, in real life, what does that look like? Are we doing like Friday foot washings? No, <laughs> not yet. We're not doing those. Right. But but it really means it's a mindset. 
I mean, I wash your socks before I wash your feet. <laughs> it, it's a mindset of knowing that I'm coming to work and I have to walk this tightrope of I need to set the vision for the company. Mm. I need to make sure that that, you know, people are doing what they need to do because this is a business. It's not a hobby. We do need to make money. And the best way to do that is to let everybody know that they're cared for from the people at the top. Right. That, and, that, and in a safe space to, to care for others. That's well. right. That's right. Some of our employees have told us things that I would have never felt comfortable telling a boss. And it is, to me, yes. it is, it's so humbling. It's so humbling because I'm like, those are people that know we care. Yes. And, and that's what servant leadership is, right? It's, yes. it's caring for people. And the profit will take care of itself, right? The profit will take care of itself. But if you're not caring for your people and you're getting good profit, you better hold on to all of it. Yes. Because <laughs> it's not going to last, right? <laughs> right. So, um, all right. Chat did the same thing again where it asked two questions in a row. So you're going to need to work on your prompts for next week. Yeah, so. stupid chat. <laughs> How would you define sustainable businesses? Businesses, nope. We're going to try that one more time. <laughs> Let's rewind. I used to get so mad at not being able to read off a piece of paper, even in school, like yeah. as a kid. I'm like, I can read these words all day long in my head, but when I make them come out of the hole, hole in my face. Anyway, how would you define sustainable business practices in the context of the tech industry? Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about innovation, right? And there's a time and place for innovation. There's also a lot of pitfalls for over innovation. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, changing things for the sake of changing them is difficult. So, you know, all the way back to the earlier in the conversation where we talked about companies that there's a, there's a huge opportunity for improving the efficiency, but they're just, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, there's... There's value in that statement, right? And I know this is contradictory because I'm like, you should be working to improve your business, but it's being smart enough to know and intuitive enough to know that there are some practices that you just need to keep doing the way you're doing them. Um, and and again, our listeners are going to get tired of hearing us say this, but caring for people is the first one, right? Like that's a sustainable business practice. Caring for your people is the most sustainable business practice, right? Yes. Like. We have to, we have to um, continually do those things, and those are the things that will, in turn, sustain our business for us. Um, if you're not taking care of your people, again, good luck, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, I don't even know what this means. Tim, can you tell us about the concept of triple bottom line and its balance between people, planet, and profit? So, of course, it's laid out in the correct sequence. People are greater than the planet, which is greater, which are both greater than profit. And it loop, uh, like, I don't have a long answer to this. I know everyone's surprised. <clears throat> but this goes back to stewardship. If you're taking care of your people and you're also taking care of the planet, it's... all going to lead to more profit. One of the, one of my big ideas that's probably five years down the road is an idea that takes the core of that sustainability, taking care of the planet idea. Air conditioning kicked out. That was weird. <laughs> um, and I don't know where I was going with that. One of Should the big I, ideas. I'm, I'm going to start over from the beginning. Yeah, big <laughs> ideas. Five years down the road. So welcome, welcome to <laughs> try, <laughs> to try your breast. <laughs> yeah, I knew you were going to get that dig in today at least That's once. The only, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> so it's just stewardship. If yeah. you take care of your people first, and you take care of the building that you work in, or the grounds that you own, or your home correctly and efficiently, it's going to drive your profit up. I mean, one of the biggest things that a business can do, and I, I would challenge every executive to sit down, go over 
all of your expenses and identify 5% that you can do without right now today, Mm -hmm. even if you're an established business. What if you're a plastics manufacturer and the company that you're buying plastic from is not the best deal on the market? Well, but we've used them for 30 years. Okay, that's great. But what if another supplier that you find is a small guy in another small town and you're going to pay for his kid to go to college in 10 years because you decided to go from the big guy to the small guy and and support that other business? I think one of the huge things about this stewardship balance and I'm wandering far away from the triple bottom line, (laughs) is if we are truly committed to this sustainability and people thing, we'll all take a round turn on looking at shop local, both in services and products. Because if we're all business owners at heart, and we're all trying to be successful, we want our friends to be successful as well. One of the biggest crux or irritations I have is when somebody has a business and they're like, hey, you should come check out my business. And the first thing out of someone's mouth is, are you going to give me a discount? (laughs) Well, no. Uh, In fact, I'm going to give you a tip because I love you and I cherish you and I want you and your family to do well. That's the, that's where we need to be going with all of this. Not what, what's in it for me. I think John F. Kennedy has a good quote about what you can do for your country or something. I don't know, whatever. So can, can you, Josh, provide some examples of tech businesses that have successfully incorporated, wow, that's a big word, sustainable practices? So did I completely miss the context of the first question? Were we talking about, like, uh, sustainability in the, in the planet? Maybe. <laughs> I don't. Okay. I'm not. Ch- look, I'm going to have a talk with Chad about this. Okay? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'll be honest, I don't know. One of the things that is, uh, that is um, I'm going to say somewhat of a detriment to our company is that we do software. We, we require very little outside anything. Yes. Right? Like we have computers and that's – we have a whiteboard <laughs> and a couple chairs and a couple desks. Like that's the world of software development. Yes. So I probably don't think about this as much as I should. Um, because again, we, you know, we have vendors that we use though, that are running massive servers and I don't know what they're doing in terms of best business practices around sustainability, but I will, (laughs) I will, because I don't, I don't know the answer to this. So I, this, this is, this is a really interesting topic that we need to evaluate, um, you know, the vendors that we're using and what the sustainability looks like for them. For us, like I said, we're so... You know, we, we don't we don't um, consume a lot of resources other than electricity. So maybe we need to get treadmill desks so we're powering our own laptops. No thanks. This is <laughs> no. no. Um, Long term benefits for businesses that adopt sustainable 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 practices. What do you think the long term benefits are? Every business that has a parking lot right now is wasting that space. It is, so (laughs) let me go back and give you context because I had a whole conversation in my head while you were asking that question. So I have written down here, it's efficient and God commands it. So there's a lot of, again, the, the Bible is very clear about our stewardship of the planet, period. Stop. Full stop. And this is one of the I'm going to I'm going to kick this political soapbox out of the way and make this one comment. It fascinates me that the Republicans who are arguably very conservative in their Christian values, whether that's, you know, a- any one of the Christian faiths. And we're like, hey, I need more oil and I need bigger engines and louder cars and roll coal 
<laughs> and in reality, that's 180 degrees out from what we're being taught in Sunday school about what God demands of our time and our care for the world around us. And I look at things like Indiegogo had a campaign about 10, 12 years ago for a company called Solar Roadways. And the whole idea were these hexagonal tiles that uh, were solar panels that made a roadway system or a parking system that were like replaceable, hot, hot swappable for, for all you folks from the 2010s um, when that was all the rage. Um, <clears throat> and as far as I know, there's only a small fraction of companies that have actually gone to solar roadways. And, in, and I could be wrong. So in, in the comments, you can tell me how wrong I am. Um, and just that one product, if you're a dentist's office and you have a parking lot, you could be collecting solar energy, storing it in a battery pack and using it to grind the filth off my teeth. It, it, right. Yeah. And, and and yet we're like, mm, but that might cost a big investment. Yeah, sure. You're right. It probably does. But when your son takes over the business in 20 years, he won't have to worry about that pesky electrical problem. And Penelec won't have to worry about their deteriorating uh, electrical grid. It, and it just goes further and further and forward down the road. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and so. that's, a, that's a real problem, right? The electrical grid in the United States is a real problem that we don't talk a lot about. But it's a... All it, of the utilities are in desperate yes. condition. Right. You can, you can see it by drive. <laughs> drive from New York to Ohio through Pennsylvania on, route, on, on Interstate 90. And you will see the condition of the highway bridges just in 40, 50 miles. Right. And there are states that have money for their infrastructure, and there are states that don't, and it becomes very apparent when you see that stuff. Okay. So anyway, uh, Soapbox, let's set that thing on fire and not bring it back into the podcasting studio. How do you, Josh, how do you see the role of sustainability shaping the future of technology in businesses? And I'm also going to let you... Close us too. Um, I mean, it's it's an entire industry in and of itself, and there's going to be a bunch of sub industries that come out of it as well. Um, so, back to the whole AI, machine learning, how jobs are going to get lost because of it. There's also entire industries being created. What is it going to mean when you merge um, these smart electrical? Uh, smart uh, energy consumption devices and smart energy producing devices um, with AI and machine learning, right? Like, what does that look like? I don't know. And I don't know if anybody does yet, but there's going to be an industry around it. Because... Tesla, Tesla already has a platform that's live for their mega packs mm -hmm. to that manages the collection of energy, storage of energy and dispersion of energy. And all of that technology is also embedded in the power walls that people can install in their mm -hmm. homes. There's a huge potential for disruption in that specific industry right yeah. now. Yeah. So you have companies like Tesla that are leading the way on a lot of these things, right? But a lot of what they're doing will turn into industries because other people are going to adopt it. And they're yes. going to be like, oh, we're going to figure it out. There's other smart people out there. Um so yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very excited about where it is. I wasn't quite honestly until we've had some conversations, and right. and your um, excitement for it has gotten me excited. Um, my background is in electrical engineering. That's I don't talk about this a lot, but like that's what my degree's in. I'm actually actually an electrical engineer. Um, You're really far from home. <laughs> <laughs> so this stuff is exciting, right? It, it's um, it's it's again going to be an entire industry with sub industries that we can't even imagine yet. So. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. All right. We've talked long enough. If anybody's still here, we're going to go ahead and skip out of your way. Yeah. Uh, whether you're a seasoned a professional, <laughs> whether you're a seasoned professional, a budding tech enthusiast, enthusiast, or a curious listener, try your best has something for you. So tune in and join us as we explore the future of technology. One potentially engaging episode at a time. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys.